I live near the Ozark Mountains, and there are often lots of strange happenings reported, but I have never experienced something for myself until just a few weeks ago. People go missing all the time, and bodies are found. Strange sightings or sounds are witnessed by hikers, walkers, even kids on trips. I have no explanation whatsoever for what I saw and heard. I've been puzzling it over a few days, and it still makes no sense. I wasn't even out for a walk, or any of the more typical scenarios. I was standing on my back porch, looking at the yard, calling for my cat, actually. It was late evening, and she should have been in by now. It was a real still and quiet evening, and I would have been able to hear her meowing if she was answering my call, like she usually does. Instead of a meow, though, I heard a very distinctive growl, low and quiet, so if I had not been such a still evening, I likely would have picked up on it. Something about it caused me immediate concern for my cat, not for myself, just yet. I called her name again, Buttercup. Still, nothing. But I did get the sense that there was something shifting slowly on the other side of the fence at the back of my yard. At this point, I wasn't afraid. More worried about my cat and that whatever was outside my yard was possibly some sort of predator. I didn't want to scare it off right then, in case it had her. So I crept up to the fence and just listened for a moment. I could for sure hear something behind there, breathing heavily, more like panting and that growl. Because it was late evening and dark, and the fact that I lived near the mountains and not in the middle of a city, there wasn't a ton of light. The moon was giving me some help, but otherwise, the yard was pretty dark. I edged my way along the fence until I got to the gate. Luckily, I'd replaced it fairly recently, so it opened pretty well, without making too much noise. Since there had been no sounds from my cat, Buttercup, I thought that I'd check to see what was out there. Not being a complete schmuck, I grabbed the shovel that was next to the gate, just in case it was a coyote or something. I will try to describe what I saw to you. Bearing in mind it was dark, and my eyes were trying to adjust whilst my brain was trying to make sense of the madness. You see, there was something there by the fence, just as I had heard. It appeared to be on all fours as you would expect an animal to be, but the body looked wrong somehow. It was the way its back was arched, and the head was hanging low despite the fact that I could see through the dark and that it was completely covered in a light-colored hair. It almost looked like a person on their hands and knees, or like when you're a kid and you try to spider walk. It was making that heavy panting and low growl noise as I stared at it. I couldn't see the head properly as it was bent, facing the floor. Again, more like a person than an animal was meant to be in that position. It was just beginning to raise its head when I heard a meow. Looking behind to see me was Buttercup, pressed up against the fence, looking scared. As I bent down to pick her up, I then took my eyes off the thing behind me, just for a moment or two. Just a moment. But, when I turned back, Buttercup now safely in my arms. The thing was no longer low on the ground. It stood up on two legs. It was as tall as me, and alongside that very hairy body, I finally got to see its face. Albeit very quickly, and as I said, it was dark, but the face, it looked human. It then ran, and when I say ran, it was gone in a flash. And so was I, back into the house, with my cat, 
locking every door and window that I could find. That was about three weeks ago now. Buttercup is now a house cat exclusively. No way I'm letting her back outside. I have no idea what that thing could have been. But I have heard stories of men who can turn into animals. I just never until now ever believed it could even be a remote possibility. My first ever memory is one of two that I look upon as unexplained. It is a short memory. I think I was about four years old. I know this because at the time, we were living somewhere in New Mexico and I was in my first ever big girl bed, as in no railings and not a crib. We moved to a different state before I even turned five. My mother maintains that the house we lived in at the time was built on Native American burial grounds. I don't know if this is true, and Mom also reports a lot of paranormal happenings during our four years there. I remember very little. The massive sky, just because the land was so flat, and the white stone gate that surrounded our garden. I don't really have any memories before this time. There are things I know, because of pictures or stories, but this is my first ever living, feeling, terrifying memory. I remember waking up from my sleep in the middle of the night to a low growl. At the end of my bed, the red eyes of a large black dog burned in the darkness, glaring at me as it snarled. But the dog was not quite a dog. It's hard to describe, because it was physically a dog. I could also see a man's eyes staring at me, as if wearing the mask or illusion of a dog, if that makes any sense. I am now 29, but the memory has remained vivid. I remember my pink sheets, the dark room, the red eyes, and terror. I don't remember what happened next, and I assumed for a long time that it was just a really bad nightmare I had as a little girl. I never really mentioned it. I didn't really understand it at the time, and my childhood became pretty complicated soon after. However, when I was about 13, I started telling my mother about it, sort of out of the blue, on one of the nighttime bike rides we used to do occasionally to go on together, and she immediately became very animated, as she claimed to have seen the exact same thing in that house at the end of her bed, only she did not think it was a man in a dogskin mask, but just a big black dog with glowing red eyes. About ten years pass, while getting high with one of my brothers, we were talking about supernatural stories, and I brought it up again. He asked me to retell the story, and then told me that it sounded a lot like something he had come across while looking up different tribal beliefs in the Americas. Something called a skinwalker. We spent the rest of the night finding out what we could about them. But... There was surprisingly very little info on there about it, beyond a description, and few stories here and there. My family settled in the UK a while ago, and we just entered a second lockdown. I'm out of a job, so I find myself with a bunch of free time to chase up on things that I've pushed to the back of my mind. I'm pretty skeptical in general. I think it's likely that I had a nightmare. I had a lot of them as a kid, and still do sometimes, like screaming myself awake nightmares, to my embarrassment. However, what makes me take pause is that my mother saw it too, and beyond that, at four years old in the mid-90s, I doubt I ever heard of anything like what I saw. It just seems a little implausible that I would come up with something so closely matching this thing that has been talked about for hundreds of years, and is still talked about today. But, supposing I put my skepticism to one side, three things really bug me. Number one, 
every other story I have ever read about skinwalkers seem to hinge on the fact that they are not able to get into your home. And the story narrator always seems to think that the very worst will happen if they do. Well, mine was totally in the house. Visited two different bedrooms and just snarled, stared, scared us. Number two, if I'm honest, life for my family got pretty hard after that. We were very unlucky. A devastating death. Horrible sudden illness that was never recovered from. Constant drug and alcohol abuse. Attacks on the family and more. Honestly, it was a really bad spiral down. Sometimes I wonder. And number three. I have read in a couple places that you should never lock eyes with one, as it could take control of your body or be absorbed into you. We definitely locked eyes. There was really nowhere else to lock. Being in front of those eyes made me feel like a deer in front of the headlights, frozen, staring right back. So yeah, I have questions. I sorta of wanna go searching. I sort of want to just forget about it. I sometimes wonder if I'm cursed. My cousins live in some remote, middle-of-nowhere place that could easily feature in a movie, like Deliverance, if it wasn't for the fact that their actual house is kinda nice. Still, their area is handmade for a horror story, and sure enough, they have told me stuff that they've seen and heard, and more recently smelt over the years. The smell part was evidently the worst of the lot. They ended up getting some work eyes in, as of course they assumed there was some practical cause for their smell. Backed up sewage, that kind of thing. But no, despite being in the middle of nowhere, they take good care of their stuff and there were no issues with pipes or septic tanks. They searched under the house. Maybe a raccoon had died down there, but nothing. It also came and went. The smell wasn't always there, and it didn't seem to have a pattern either. My youngest cousin, Ruby, was still only a kid, around nine or ten, and she had began getting night terrors and only being able to sleep with my aunt, which was kind of draining too. So, aunt asked if I could come down for a few days and help out, since I was home from college for just a bit. Nothing happened those first three days. No smells, no sounds. No one saw any strange shadows, and Ruby was quite content to sleep with me. Despite a ten-year-old age gap, she'd always been like a little sister to me. Then, on the third night, it happened. Ruby woke in a sudden panic, which woke me too. As I was hugging her to calm her, I noticed the smell. It was worse than a public restroom, where the person before you had the stomach flu, added in with some gone-off egg salad and meat that had been left out in the sun all combined. I was trying to calm Ruby, and to not gag myself, when to add to the whole trauma, I heard a voice calling my name. I remember sitting bolt upright, because I hadn't heard the voice for several years. Do you hear anything? I had asked Ruby, and she nodded. What can you hear? I had asked her, and she replied. I hear Nona, calling my name. You hear Nona's voice, I checked and she is saying your name, Ruby, right? She nodded, and continued to bury her head in my arms. Again, I too heard Arnona, only I heard my name, Chase. I don't think that there is any way to get Ruby and Chase mixed up. Oh, and Arnona, that very distinctive, gravelly voice was both heard, by us. She has already been dead for three plus years. I ended up doing some googling that night, long after Ruby had safely drifted back to sleep. 
It was the first time I'd ever witnessed anything. I don't believe in ghosts, necessarily. Not in the way that they can randomly appear. Nona wouldn't leave New York. We always had to travel to see her. She had never been to aunt's. Plus, aside from not wanting to leave her home, she was the nicest old lady we could have all wished for to have as a grandmother. Caring, generous, and kind. A large chunk of my inheritance from her was paying for my college. So I searched for mimicking dead person's voice, awful smell, strange shadows, and even night terrors. You guys are likely all way ahead of me. House in the middle of nowhere. Very likely to have been Native American territory in the past. All the signs point to a Wendigo. When I was in college, I went camping out in the desert with a close buddy of mine who had horses. We fancied ourselves as some kind of cowboys of the old times. I was a city boy, so it was strange, exciting, and a wee bit scary. Especially when he told me about coyotes, how they scream and howl, and can make terrible noises, but they shouldn't come too close to camp. Shouldn't being the word which made it scary. Since I never really stepped foot in the outdoors, I knew nothing. Very naive. I can distinctly remember lying there and hearing the noise. I was glad he had warned me about it, or I think I would have jumped on the horse and got out of there while I still could. It was disturbing and unsettling enough when I knew what the sounds were. Of course, he had promised me that they wouldn't come close, that we wouldn't hear the howling, snuffling, sniffing, and what sounded like one peeing on the side of the tent. Just stay still, he ordered, when I was literally shaking in fear. They're just being nosy, marking their territory. And I tried. Maybe would have been okay, if it wasn't for the horses. They were tethered next to the tent, aside from a few disgruntled whinnies. They hadn't kicked up too much of a fuss. Until now. Now, they started neighing and snorting, and we could hear them struggling and kicking as they were trying to break free. My buddy suddenly produced a gun that I had no idea he'd even brought, and a flashlight, although it was incredibly light out, considering we were miles from any kind of roads or houses. He said he just let off a warning shot to scare them. But first, he wanted me to go to the horses as they would be spooked by the noise. Before this can happen, though, we saw the coyote. Now, as I've already told you, I'm a city boy through and through. The closest I'd come to any kind of wild animal was the zoo. I remember seeing a deer for the first time and how amazing that was. I know, please, if you're a country person, try not to laugh. I was scared enough thinking this was a regular wild beast, with teeth and claws, and no sense of right and wrong. If it attacked us, it was bad. If it attacked the horses, it was equally bad, as we would have a hell of a trek back. But even me as an amateur and all things in nature knew what I was now seeing was in no way natural. The coyote, if you could call it that, to start with was huge. Giant. I'm talking supersized. When it saw us come out of the tent, it reared up on its hind legs, so it was like a coyote-type man standing there. My buddy, being a good old country boy, shot at it right away, spooking the horses. He pumped around four or five shots into that thing, and it just stood there, as if the bullets went straight through it, or just wasn't being bothered. The horses were now going crazy. My buddy just stood there, looking shocked that this thing wasn't even being affected by the bullets. And then, it just gave an almighty howl, ran off on two legs, but quicker than I have ever seen any sort of man or creature move. After it was gone, we didn't say anything for quite some time. 
we were successful in calming the horses and going back to the tent. He stayed by the flap with it open, gun close in hand all night. As soon as it was light enough, we packed up, rode home. No questions asked. Once we were back and settled the horses, I asked him what that thing was. What had we seen last night? I had never seen him look so scared. Then, he proceeded to tell me about an old legend that he had heard, since he was just a boy, but never believed it could be true. What he told me was something about a were-coyote. This was apparently a man who had made some sort of pact with black magic practicers, who would grant him the power to shapeshift and change into an animal that he first killed, and then wore the skin of. He didn't need the full moon, or for it to even be nighttime. As long as he wore the skin, he would turn. But as with all the powers over years, the man would become more beast than human, and would spend hours roaming the deserts, hunting, as an animal would, stuck in that constant half-life of part man, part beast. He was certain that that's what we had seen last night. I just don't know. It seems so unbelievable. And yet, I had seen that thing with my own two eyes, witnessed it being shot full of lead, and also, it racing away quicker than the speed of light. Something really terrifying. Something really terrifying happened to me just a few days ago. I really wanted to share it to see if anyone might be able to explain to me what on earth I saw. I usually don't post on here often, so I'm hoping that anybody can answer my question. Anybody with experience in this sort of thing. I was in the woods, walking my dog as usual. Something I do all the time, and have for years. Same woods, same trail same walk. Sometimes we see deer there, and my dog could not care less. He never really bothers chasing them. A lazy son of a gun, to be honest. Sometimes, though, the woods can smell kind of funky. I mean, it is a giant toilet for nature, and there are patches of stagnant water around, which, thank God, my dog has no interest in drinking out of. You also find the dead bird, or a creature. But this time, it was like all those things mixed together and amplified by a thousand. To add to the stench, which was actually eye-wateringly bad, the dog began acting more like a wimp than usual, whining, wrapping itself around my legs. I'm not too cruel, but he clearly needed to go and do his business. Otherwise, there would be an unwanted present for me on the way home. So, I try to shake him off, and get him to at least go, and sniff some trees to go get in the zone. I heard some crunching, coming from right behind us. Like something stepping on the leaves and twigs on the ground floor. As I said, there's ample wildlife in here. So I wasn't too worried, until I turned around to see what was there. By now, the dog was shaking. He was in between my legs and trembling so much. My own body was vibrating. The smell was even worse now too, and I had to put my hand over my nose and breathe through my mouth. Then, I saw what was behind us. It was like a deer, but although I knew instinctively that it was not a deer, I couldn't really think exactly what else it could be. It was much bigger than even a stag, and had the most magnificent yet terrifying antlers. The whole body of the deer looked wrong. Very thin, fragile, gaunt, and starving. Gray in color, and parts of the fur actually looked as if they were hanging off its body. My first thought, because I tried convincing myself that this was normal, and it was indeed a stag, and possibly diseased and sick, which would account for the smell and bits of apparent flesh. However, two very distinct things happen next, which are the reasons I'm telling you my story and not having reported the creature to any other authority. Number one, 
This thing proceeded to stand up on two legs. I looked over at my dog. It was clearly looking right at my dog. And I'm actually grateful for that. Number two. This is really messed up. I still don't know for certain this even happened because, well, it sounds so whack. And the only witness was the dog. He can't tell me if I was just hallucinating at this point. But I swear to you, this thing spoke or knew my name. I swear that when it stood up like a person, staring at the dog, it spoke my name. You can bet I hightailed it out of there, dragging my dog with me. But only after a few seconds, something he never does, but only after a few seconds, that dog was dragging me as we raced back to the opening and jumped back in the car. I jumped in. The dog got in the front. Something he never does. Something I never allow. I just needed to get far away from here. Can you help me? I've barely slept since this happened. My poor dog. I don't think I will ever be able to step foot onto that trail or those woods again. How did this thing know my name? How could it talk to start with? I just need some answers. Please, can someone tell me what that thing was? The plain spoken events of my story won't make much sense without a little bit of context. So, please, bear with me. I've been close to my grandmother my entire life. I could tell there was something different about her when I was just a little girl. I just didn't know what it was. As I grew up, I found out it was several things. One of them was that she was a proud woman, and she wore our family's Native American heritage more than everyone else did. The second was that she was not afraid of practicing the magic of our ancestors. She had all kinds of wards and daily rituals that she kept by clockwork, and apparently it worked, because I always remembered her being something of a mystical figure from my childhood, like someone out of a storybook. Do you remember having anyone from your childhood whom you just felt better as soon as you saw them? Everything about them made you feel better and you felt that at any moment, they could lead you off to a world of wonder and beauty. And that's how I felt about my grandmother. I would eventually find out that she didn't keep up her practice of magic for the sake of her heritage. But, for the time being, it was enough to see it as just a part of her sticking to her identity. The memory of a child is far from perfect. But I swear, the woman never aged. She looked the same way when I was a toddler as she did the last time I ever saw her before she would pass away a month later. Now, there was someone else in my childhood that was the exact opposite of my grandmother. Someone that when I saw him and heard him, I felt apprehensive, uncomfortable, and tense. I hope none of you can relate to that. That person was my very own uncle never had a criminal record to speak of. Neither did he have a bad reputation. He just had this miasma of badness hanging off of him. He would try to hug me and hold me like any of the other relatives, but it was like magnets with the same charge. When he got close, I was compelled to get away. He had less and less of the effect on me as I grew up, but it never went away. It was quite a puzzle to my maturing mind, because the older we get, the more we're taught to explain things in concrete terms, which I might add is how the death of childhood magic happens. At last, but not least, I swear the man would not stop looking at me. He didn't exactly stare, but he did seem to always look for just a few seconds longer than he ought to, but not long enough for me to get fed up and call him out. So she passed away, and as many members of the family made the trip down to be present for the funeral as possible. Again, she being a proud woman, she never left the res. Much of the accommodations that were within my family's personal price range 
were either in or near the desert, along desolate highways. We ended up in a single-story hotel, where the only thing you could see outside that suggested civilization was the asphalt. The rest was sand and cacti. My parents could tell that I wasn't exactly taking my grandmother's passing very well, so they spent the extra money and let me have my own room. Some people find the company of others soothing during times of grief. I'm the opposite. And that's when the night came, and something happened. It was knocking that was so soft that it could have been mistaken for the sound of some part of the building expanding. But it got louder, gradually increased. There was no way that it was a tree tapping the building. There weren't any trees on the property. It eventually became so loud that there was a definite intention behind it. It was the rhythm that my grandmother used to drum out on the bathroom or bedroom door to make sure if it was okay for her to enter. I wasn't entirely asleep, nor was I fully awake, but I knew it. I knew it was morning. I remembered what I heard, but it was easy to write off as a dream. We went to the funeral service, and it was every bit as dismal and heavy as I expected. We filed by her casket, and she looked like the embalmers hadn't even touched her. The magic she had practiced when she was alive seemed to have a preserving effect on her. Seeing her look like herself was the only bright spot in the entire matter. There was one other thing that stood out as unusual. My uncle, her son, took the liberty of stroking her cheek. And then he did something that happened so quickly, I wasn't sure if I had actually seen it. When he drew his hand back to himself, there was a slight tick of the wrist, as if he either had an involuntary twitch or he had plucked a single hair from her head. I was sure that I had seen the hair between his fingers, but it was over before I could verify any suspicions. We decided to stay one more night. The whole thing was much more exhausting than we ever expected. That following night went the same as the one before. I slept on my own, and that knocking happened again while I was in a twilight state of being awake. It didn't shake me like it did the last time. So, I was about to drop back down into dreamless sleep when I heard my grandmother's voice come from the other side of the door. It wasn't just her voice. She was saying my name. She was asking if she could come inside. By that point, I was now fully awake, and my heart was pounding out the rhythm of the feet of a fleeing rabbit. There was a pause when I was not answering, and then the voice on the other side began to whistle. That's when I knew that I wasn't being visited by my grandmother. That's when I held perfectly still and did everything I could not to breathe. I think most of you can tell where this is going. No, I never found out for sure if it was my uncle or not, but that's the working conclusion that I've arrived at. No, I never found out for sure if my uncle was a skinwalker, although he would have been in the environment necessary to discover the lore and the magic behind how to become one. I did find out much later that my own grandmother had been so steeped in Native American magic due to a deeply personal fear of skinwalkers. And I don't remember seeing my grandmother and my uncle in the same room together, ever. There's a story to be heard in there somewhere, for sure. And it's a story that I seem to have been along with for a paragraph or two. But it's a story that I'm not sure I exactly want to hear. I worked in a foster home and I'm proud to say that it's not the kind of place that generates the horror stories you hear about. It's located in Arizona, and the place's reputation is pristine. They may not be able to magically conjure good parents for some of these kids out of thin air, but as long as the kids 
are under their jurisdiction. They are very much cared for, and we did everything in our power to make sure they felt loved. The founder built the place with the attitude of what if the child never gets adopted? How do you make them feel okay if nobody wanted them? Simple. You run a good foster home, and you run it the way you would run a good family. Look, I'm not trying to throw a sales pitch. I'm just trying to give you the context of my story. It's my understanding that many of the creatures that appear in the accounts on your show are drawn to negativity, bad things, bad places. It's that much more puzzling to me that I have a story to tell, since, honestly, negativity was not a part of this place's history. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we were in any way perfect. We did have one kidnapping, and since then, the security and supervision protocol had been made tighter. Even in spite of those steps, a child accidentally got left outside when she decided she was going to hide from the staff when it was time to corral everyone inside. If she had not been sobbing so loudly, she may have never been found. I myself was present for that incident, and it's probably an additional factor in me having the story to tell in the first place. We have a playground that's bigger than most, and you will find at any school. It's a testimony to how much our founder wanted the children that spend time with us to be so comfortable. The time it takes to get everyone off the playground and double check that no child is left outside is a long and drawn out process. Tags are issued, heads counted, then everyone goes inside. Heads are counted again, where the main hallway veers off into bedrooms. One afternoon, after the children had come inside from playing, and they had all been accounted for, I was sitting in a caretaker's lounge with a cup of coffee, just finally catching my breath. It was completely silent, and I thought I had heard through the wall a little voice say, let me in, three separate times. It was said so flat, and in the same way with each repetition, that I thought it was a child's doll or something. But after a while, the voice repeated a second time, saying, please let me in, three times. The phrasing changed each time I heard it, and it was probably the sixth time when I noticed that the only way it could be coming from the other side of the wall is if it was outside. Still skeptical, because all kids had been accounted for, but it was my duty to make sure. I unlocked the outside door, went out and scout around. The playground felt emptier than usual. For some reason, the entire world felt empty. I estimated the spot where the voice would have to be if I was going to hear it in the lounge. But naturally, there was nothing there. There wasn't even a toy. A shiver ran through me before I collected myself and headed back inside. I looked up, just in time to see the outside door close and the latch shut. The door is on a spring, so that it closes itself when anyone goes through it. So, somebody other than me had just gone through the door. I wasn't taking any chances. I got out my walkie and radioed to the other staff. We had set up a system in an emergency where staff runs to designated stations in the hallway at regular checkpoints, so that if anyone wants to get any further in or out, they have to get through two staff members, and they're always stationed at a point where there's no way around. So, when everyone took their positions, nobody had reported seeing anyone suspicious. Nobody reported seeing anyone at all. I couldn't get past that outside door, and closing without me. But there was simply no rational explanation. I reluctantly let it go. The day ended. Everybody was tucked in, and I personally made several rounds around the facility to make sure there was nobody lurking around. Everything was all clear. Only then, I could allow myself to stop holding my breath, sit down in my lounge, 
It wasn't really mine, but nobody else liked it, because it tended to get really cold around that time of year. I was working on getting paperwork done, but I ended up idly looking at clickbait on the internet, still busy in the back of my head, trying to make sense of what had happened to the front door while I was outside. After a while, I heard the same voice from earlier. It spoke just as mechanically, and it repeated another phrase three separate times. Only this time it was saying, let me out. I froze, not dare moving a muscle, not even daring to breathe. The request came a second time, slightly changed to please let me out, repeated three times. I didn't hesitate to radio out that time. Staff got up, took their positions, and a few came to join me in the lounge. I told them what I had heard, and we went to the front to investigate. There was nobody waiting for us in the front of the doors. One of the staff members absentmindedly unlocked the front door to take a look around outside. Something, I don't know what, came running up the hallway towards us. It was moving unnaturally fast, and it stood at least as tall as I did. I'm rather tall as far as women go. What got to me the most were the two dimly lit glowing red eyes that I could see in the head shape. The second thing I noticed was the short antlers that seemed to be sprouting from its skull. These observations were made in less than two seconds, because in that very space of time, it had sprinted out the front door. I seemed to be the only one that noticed the thing make its escape. I must have looked like a madwoman when I shouted about not letting the thing outside, and then yelling about chasing it and not letting it get away. The staff members assisting me looked at me like I was crazy. We did a head count on all the sleeping children. Three of them were missing. That ended up being the longest, most frustrating, most fruitless undertaking I had ever experienced in that foster home. All anyone knew about those three kids was that they were in their beds the last time anybody saw them. There was no sign of them ever leaving their beds or their rooms. No sign of anybody ever coming into the rooms. Nothing. No signs of a struggle. No hidden bones or buried bodies. Nothing. They were simply gone. And there was my testimony about a supernatural thing that only I ever saw and heard. Because of that, they were starting to cast a very critical eye on me. This eventually led to me resigning. In the end, they couldn't pin anything on me, which was really saying something because the system is really good at making a villain out of an innocent bystander with circumstantial evidence when they want to badly enough. There wasn't any evidence to work with. So, here I am. These days, I work a job that I'm pretty underqualified for. Despite not having any charges leveled against me, nobody will accept me at any foster homes or any caretaking facilities. The stink of that bad situation it just seems to follow me wherever I go. My faith in the system is completely shaken. Any system that fails to protect children and then punishes the people that protect them faithfully is long overdue for a change. If anyone out there has experienced something remotely similar, just know that you are not alone. I'd even be willing to talk if you wanted to reach out to me, and we might be able to help each other Thank you so much, What Looks Beneath, for being a channel for me to, and others like me, to get our experiences out there in the open to other like-minded individuals who are willing to listen and understand. One of the tourist traps here in Southern California was a hunter who sold animal pelts that he had hunted and prepared himself. Nobody seemed to be questioning the legality of what exactly he was doing. So, 
I didn't have anything against getting a genuine coyote pelt. A big part of the sale was the authenticity of the man himself. If there was ever a person that could tell you was full-blooded Indian just by looking at him, it was him. The only difference being that with most Native Americans that I've met, they seem to have a serene wisdom in their eyes. This man didn't have that. There was something harsh and hard-edged in his gaze, but I figured that just came with hunting in the deserts of Southern California. At the time, coyotes were marked as being an overpopulation issue, so not surprisingly, most of what we had for sale were derived from coyotes. I bought one pelt that had been fashioned into a carrying pouch that I could wear on my waist, and since cooler weather was around the corner, I bought a skin hat. I went my way, and that was the last I ever expected to see of the guy. His goodbye smile went all the way up to his one good eye. The other one, that was whited out with a cataracts, registered no emotion. I got on the highway for the long journey back to South Dakota. It was only a matter of time before I would have to pull over to sleep, but I tried to make that moment as far away as possible. I don't know what made me look out of the corner of my eye, but when I did, I saw what appeared to be some sort of dog-like creature running on all fours and doing a great job of keeping pace with my vehicle. I was driving the legal limit on the highway. Its overall bearing suggested that it was a coyote, but the legs were incredibly long, unnaturally long. It almost looked like somebody had taken the legs from a deer and glued them onto a wild dog. I checked my mirrors. I was the only person on the highway. It was a full moon, so there was plenty of light, and I could see that my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. I tried to get my phone out to take a picture, but I felt myself seize up when the creature looked right at me. It had one coppery eye that was perfectly clear, and then it had one that was whited out. It bared its teeth at me in a snarl, but I knew deep down that it was a grin. And, just like a leaf in a hurricane, it was gone. Is it possible? Now I know this sounds crazy, but is it possible that the man that I bought the pelt from has the power to shapeshift or could have been a skinwalker? I know it might sound far-fetched, but I can't help draw an eerie correlation between the two. What is your opinion?